so we are in a sermon series that's called uh, Cultivating a Hunger for God. Uh, it's really is, uh, kind of what I feel the Lord is doing in, um, in our time uh, in, this, uh, in this church, a hunger for God. I think there's many people here hungry for, for more. The weird thing with the presence of God and the goodness of God is that it, it satisfies you, but you still are hungry. <laughs> there's this weird paradox in that. You're like, there's always this, this yearning for, uh, for more, even though it's very satisfying coming into God's presence and, and being with Him and being in relationship with Him. But we feel that the Lord is up to something in our church, a sense that uh, through building rhythms of prayer, opportunities to express that hunger for God's presence, we are kind of preparing and positioning ourselves for a fresh move of God. And that's also what I want to preach into today. In the message, I'm going to share three prayers with you that position us uh, or position you for a fresh move of God. Three prayers. And these are three prayers that have really shaped my life and kind of give me a, a framework and a bit of a direction for, for how to pray. Um, it's, uh, I'm simply sharing some things with you that, that, that are in my heart, things that regularly come up in, uh, in my prayers when I pray out loud in a prayer meeting. Uh, and um, yeah, how, how God has shaped that, uh, that in me. So it's really something personal I'm sharing with you. Uh, so I hope you're ready. Uh, and I hope it's going to be helpful. So first prayer, simple prayer that I, I, I really hope that you're familiar with. Uh, and that's your kingdom come, your will be done. And as you know, this is uh, straight from the, from the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, and I understand this prayer to be the prayer underneath all intercessory prayer. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Anytime that we pray for anything, whether it's healing or restoration, revival, breakthrough, blessing, provision, for someone to uh, get saved, for someone to encounter the presence of God, basically we're praying an expression of this prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done. In my study of the book Revelation a couple of years ago that resulted in that, uh, that book, um, something that really stuck with me and that really shifted something in my faith is this understanding of what is happening in Revelation 21, 22, the last two chapters of the Bible with this vision of New Jerusalem. It really describes the complete fulfillment of the kingdom of God. This is, this is what it looks like when the kingdom of God is completely established on earth, without any hindrance, without any rebellion, without any misunderstandings. No, it's completely here. He's making all things new. This is where God is moving human history. This is, this is the climax of, of all of history. This is the climax of the Bible. All of the plot lines kind of come together in those last two chapters. And what do we see there in New Jerusalem? First, there's the unhindered, unfiltered presence of God. God is dwelling with his people. There's no need for a temple. Like it, New Jerusalem is the temple. It's this, this place where God is dwelling and where we have full access to the presence of God. Secondly, there's this complete healing and restoration of all people. So he says, behold, I'm making all things new. And then it describes that the, the tree of life is in New Jerusalem, that all the nations are, are like the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nation. So there's this idea that, that everything is coming to a full restoration. And then what you see is a flourishing humanity. It's, it's this, the best of human culture and the best of God's creation. Like, and, 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 and humans' creation power received from, uh, from him is, is coming together in this beautiful way. So there's this flourishing of humanity. Now... If this is what it looks like when the kingdom of God is fully and completely, as the theological word is, consummated, like it's, 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 it's completely there, it's completely established, that tells us something about what it looks like when that future is breaking into the present. Because that's a prayer that we're praying. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's this invitation. Let that future break into the present. Let that kingdom break into the present and be established among us. See, here's what I find so interesting. As we 
often would pray very safe prayers. You know, a safe prayer. Can't go wrong with a safe prayer. You know, it says, Lord, if you will, would you please something, something, something. You know, if it's within your will, then maybe. I want to be careful in what I say here, but there's a sense of mystery around, around the ways of God. Yeah, the ways of God are beyond man. We, we don't know what's in his mind. We don't know what are his plans. We don't know his ways. They're a bit of a mystery to us. But his will is revealed to us. What he wants, what he wills for humans is not unclear. It's not a mystery. That's clearly revealed to us. When his will is completely done on earth, what does it look like? It looks like New Jerusalem. It looks like people having full access to his presence. It looks like restoration. It looks like healing. And it looks like flourishing. That's his will. It's not a mis- his will is not a mystery. His ways are a mystery. But there's something very different. And when we pray, we pray into his will. If we are praying for someone's salvation, it's not, if you will, would you please? It's, Lord, let the future break into the present. Because your will is salvation of all men. So let your, let your will become manifest. Let your kingdom come. If we're praying for someone's healing, we're praying within God's will. If we're praying for the transformation of the city of Groningen, that it will be turned upside down for God's kingdom, it's not, if you will, would you please? It's, this is your will, would would you bring your kingdom? We have a certain authority given by the Holy Spirit in our prayers. We know, we have a good understanding of the will of God. And so we can pray boldly. We can pray without hesitation. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. It's an invitation to let the future break into the present. And one expression of this very same prayer is the prayer, come Holy Spirit. And we really like that in the vineyard. Come Holy Spirit. I often get questions about this prayer. What does it mean? (laughs) What do you expect is going to happen? Can you pray to the Holy Spirit directly? How does it work? And I'm always a little bit amazed at those questions, even though I really like people asking good questions. But I'm thinking, well, it's... How do I explain this? It's, come Holy Spirit is an invitation to the Holy Spirit to do what He wants to do. So the question, well, what would that look like then? The correct answer is, I don't know. Let's find out. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I know, he's, the, he's the Holy Spirit. He's not the spooky spirit. You know, we, we've stopped calling him the Holy Ghost because that spooks us a little bit. He's the, he's the Holy Spirit. He's the Spirit of God. He's, he's the presence of God manifest to us. So we say to the Spirit, your kingdom come, your will be done. Here and now. It's not this general, this abstract prayer like, oh, Lord, like, your kingdom come, your will be done. But it's this, come Holy Spirit, right now. Bring the, minister the kingdom to us right now. Minister the presence of God to us right now. Minister the, the healing and the restoration of God's kingdom to us right here and right now. It's a prayer that expresses the faith that he is here and that he wants to make his kingdom manifest to us right here and right now. It expresses this expectation it's going to happen right here and right now. And so usually after praying, come Holy Spirit, we're silent. Why? Well, we want to give him some space and not interrupt him with our or interrupt him with our prayers and with our singing. We just want to give him some space. And we position ourselves in a way that we can part, then he can partner with us. So we're kind of listening for instructions. Come, Holy Spirit, your kingdom come, your will be done. All right, second prayer. It's a very different prayer. It says, break my heart for what breaks yours. Break my heart for what breaks yours. I think most of us know this from a song. It's called Hosanna from, uh, from Hillsong, Brooke Litherwood. Uh, I think it's actually a prayer or like this phrase that comes from somewhere in YWAM. I don't know exactly who, uh, Jeff Fountain or Floyd McClellan. I don't know exactly, couldn't find it. But it's, it's an existing prayer that was kind of put into that, uh, into that song. 
It's, it's, it's such a powerful prayer because it kind of acknowledges that the God that we're serving deeply cares about the needs of this world. There's several moments in Scripture when these deep emotions from God are expressed. I'm just going to read a few of them to you. Genesis 6, uh, it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thought of his heart was only evil, continually. And the Lord regretted that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. Ezekiel 6, Then the nations... um, where they have been carried captive so it's, th- it's a context of the of the exile of the Jewish people. Uh, those who escape will remember ne- remember me. How I have been grieved by their adulterous hearts refers to idolatry, which have turned away from me, and by their eyes, um, which have lusted after their idols. So again, it's this grieved in God's heart. Now you might say, yeah, but it's God's anger over sin. It's the context is the Ark of Noah and the, and the exiles. It's this punishment over sin. And Yeah, but it's using the word grief explicitly. He's grieved in his heart, which is not he was super angry and needed to kind of you know, punch someone. No, it's, it's, he, was, he was grieved. To his, it, it hurt him in his heart. That's what it expresses. The New Testament version, I think, of this same feeling of, 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 of grief is, is compassion. Um, in the Gospel of Matthew, you see Jesus. Um, and he went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them, and he healed the sick. Jesus sees the hunger. There's both a physical and a, and a spiritual hunger for these people, um, Context here is also the feeding of the 5,000. He's moved with compassion. And so his provision and his blessing flows from the compassion that he feels in his heart. And I believe that God is looking for people that he can entrust some of his deep compassion to that he feels over humanity. Some of the grief he feels over sin and all the consequences of sin so that he can move us into prayer and he can move us into action. And so, break my heart for what breaks yours is something of an ongoing prayer for me. Uh, something I bring up in a, in a prayer uh, often. And as I've been praying this, I've, I've felt God moving me with compassion for certain things kind of revealing his heart over the things that are happening all around me. Now, I'm not saying that whenever you pray this, you'll get a sort of instant drop of, you know, brokenheartedness or <laughs> compassion over something right away. But it's, if this is something that's regularly in your prayers, he will begin to move your hearts for certain things. And so some of the things that I have sensed God's heart for is... Um, I've, I've sensed that God's heart is breaking over a generation that is growing up in confusion, something that is breaking my heart over. I've sensed God's broken heart over the ongoing, unaddressed, injustice of modern slavery, something he bre- has been breaking my heart over. I've sensed his broken heart over all those who are looking anywhere and everywhere for a sense of meaning, except for <laughs> with the living God. <laughs> I've experienced God's broken heart over people that have come to churches looking for safety and meaning and belonging, but instead found pressure, and superficiality, and rejection. I believe God's heart is breaking over the disunity among Christians, as well as the violation of the gospel and the truth of Scripture. And I've sensed God's broken heart over Christians turning to idols for meaning and purpose while Christ is more than enough. These are some of the things that God has been breaking my heart over. Things that can sometimes bring me to tears. Things that move me into prayer and into action. And at the same time, I know that God's heart is breaking over many, many, many more things. Many more issues. Many more countries. Many more cultures. Many more 
things going on in this world, and I'm just happy that in his grace, he's deciding to divide the burden a little bit over different people. And I only get some of these things. The people that God has, mo- has used most effectively to bring his kingdom are people moved with compi- compassion over some of the things that are breaking God's heart. You see this in the story of Nehemiah. He hears about the, the status of Jerusalem and his heart is broken. He's, he's in mourning and he brings it before God. And, but after that, he's moved into, into action to, to risk and to lead the, uh, the project of uh, rebuilding the city of Jerusalem. It's what, something that you see in Paul in his missions endeavors, like in spite of all the persecution, in spite, in spite of all the resistance, etc., he's, he's moved with compassion. He's, he's going back to where, where God is calling him time and time again into the danger. It's a broken heart that is moved into prayer and that is moved into action. I was reading an article the other day of, um, for, by uh, Jackie Pullinger, who is um, well-known for, for serving in Hong Kong amongst the poorest of the poor. And uh, she wrote about loving the poor, and she is talking about how she's serving in that, uh, in that city. This is many years ago. She's been serving there for, for three decades or so. And in that story, she's, in, in that arc- article, she's the, sharing the story of, of seeing a, a boy 15 years old in, this, in the street that just looks so sick, and just so like close to death. And, and as she's getting to know me a little bit, she finds out that he'd been a heroin addict since nine. Uh, and so she's moved with compassion just by the physical appearance of this boy. And after a long time of reaching out, trying to win his trust, offering help, he finally accepts and goes to, uh, into a Christian rehab center. But then the next day she re- receives a phone call that he has run away. And then she writes this about it. He says, It was then that God taught me a profound lesson about ministry to the poor. When your heart is broken over one of his children, he gives you his. When he gives you his heart, you can start to love again. The only way a heart gets bigger and has more room for God's love is by being broken. It's a broken heart that keeps you going. It's a broken heart that will not give up when it's disappointed or when it's facing resistance. And so the second prayer, break my heart for what breaks yours, is really a way that you can position yourselves for a move of God. You can position yourself to be used by God because God works through broken hearts. I need to warn you about this prayer, though. It is a risky prayer because he might just answer it and then there's no turning back. But it's a good prayer to pray. It's an important prayer to pray. Third prayer. And I think this has been on my heart for a while for our whole church uh, for the coming year, for the coming years. It's a prayer, fill us up and send us out. Um, Again, something that you might recognize from a song. It's a prayer from a song called God of Justice by Tim Hughes, written before some of y'all were born. Uh, (laughs) He was a famous worship leader back in the day. (laughs) And this expresses a sort of longing to go out and to respond to God's call, to respond to respond to that taste of a broken heart, uh, of, of how his heart is breaking for something, to see his kingdom come, but also to recognize that we first need to be filled up before we can go out, because we don't want to go out in our own strength and in our own wisdom, and only with that sense of compassion. We want to go out empowered by God's Spirit. Fill us up, send us out. It's this prayer that recognizes the danger of going in your own strength and in your own wisdom and in your own way. And it's just as the disciples were first filled with the Holy Spirit before they launched the project, you know, bring the gospel to the ends of the earth, um, they were first filled with the Spirit before they could go. Jesus said, like, gives them the Great Commission and then says, go to Jerusalem and wait for the Spirit to come. He said, don't, like, 
don't go yet. You need to be filled first, and then you can be sent out. And I think this is really, I mean, this is really my heart for talking about building a, a culture of prayer and cultivating a hunger for God. We're not talking about experiencing the goodness and the glory of God and His manifest presence so that we can all have a great time by ourselves. Oh, like more Lord, more love, more good. Yes, yes, this is the feeling. All right, let's see. Uh, we can go home now. No, it's, it's not like that. The deeper motivation is here. Fill us up and send us out. Fill us up. Send us out. Understanding that for our church to have any impact out there, for us to live as ambassadors of the kingdom everywhere we go and in everything we do, it is essential that we as a church are centered around the presence of God. If we want to be on fire there, we need to keep the center red hot right here. And so to really drive this point home, I just want to share this beautiful vision from um, the book of Ezekiel with you. Now the context of this is that Ezekiel is in Babylon during the exile. The temple is destroyed, but he gets a vision for a new temple. It's a prophetic vision of something that would be far in the future, something that would be um, fulfilled in the ministry of Jesus, um, but also fulfilled in, uh, in the church. And um, so I'm just, I, I want to ask you now to, to, to stand up as, I, as I'm reading this. Because it's, it's a vision that, that, that I was reading and I was thinking, yes, Lord, let this become the truth of our, our church as well, what, what I'm about to read. Let this be a, a vision that we can carry with us in our prayers uh, for, for what the Lord is about to do in, in, in our church and something that will express, yeah, I don't know, give, give us a vision. It's Ezekiel 47, verse 1 to 9. It says, Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. The water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. And then he brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gate that faced towards the east. And behold, the water was trickling out on the south side. Going on eastward, with a measuring line in his hand, the man measured a thousand cubits, and then he led me through the water, and the water was ankle deep. And again he measured a thousand, led me through the water, and it was knee deep. And again he measured a thousand, and he led me through the water, and it was waist deep. Again, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass through, for the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in, a river that could not be passed through. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? And then he led me back to the bank of the river. And as I went back, I saw on the bank of the river very many trees on the one side and on the other. And he said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah and enters the sea. When the water flows into the sea, the water will become fresh. And wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live. And there will be very many fish. For this water goes there, that the waters of the sea may become fresh. And so everything will live where the river goes. Everywhere this river goes, it will bring life. Please remain standing with me as just go over some thoughts on this passage. It's this whole picture of the temple and the river that flows that brings life everywhere connects back to Genesis and, and it connects forward to, to Revelation 22 in the New Jerusalem. But I think it's also a picture of how the kingdom is breaking through in the meantime, in the time in between where we are in now. It's this vision of the temple where I think God intends the church and intends our church to be. 
I think the Lord's looking for communities that he can fill with his presence, where his presence is welcomed in. God comes where he's wanted. And so we want to be a welcoming environment for his presence. Knee deep, waist deep, perhaps even so that you can't even swim anymore. I can't even stand anymore, but kind of have to swim. And he's looking to fill churches with his presence. Not so that we can have a great pool party. <laughs> but so that the stream of life-giving water can flow from the church into this world. Are we going to be this as a church? Are we going to say welcome? Yes, welcome to his presence. Fall on us right now. Fall on us here today. Fill us with your presence. Even to the point that we, we have to swim. We can't stand anymore. Even when we're losing control. Yeah? When we are not in control anymore, but he is in control. Are we going to be that community? Are we prepared for that? Are we positioning ourselves for a move of God? Because what he wants to do is fill us like this temple so that the water can go gushing out in all directions and bring life wherever it goes. That's the vision. Fill us up and then send us out. Lord, we just pray that you'll do that in our church. in the coming weeks, in the coming months, in the coming years. May we keep on cultivating a hunger for your presence. A hunger for your glory to be manifest among us. Let us be like that temple in that vision that you fill with your presence, that you fill with your living water. Revive us. Anything that's broken, anything that's damaged, through all the disappointments, through all the doubts, will you bring restoration in us? Fill us. Meet with us. Even to the point when we're not in control anymore, but your Holy Spirit is in control. And he's the Holy Spirit that does beautiful things. Fill this church with your presence. Fill our hearts with your presence. Fill our homes with your presence. Fill us to overflowing. So that the water that comes gushing out of this church in our homes, in our hearts, in our lives will just bring life everywhere it goes. Bring life to our friends. Bring life to our neighborhoods. Bring life to this city, Lord. And not only our church, but all the churches here in the city. Lord, we pray. Will you come? Because we want to be a church that says, come Holy Spirit all the time. We want to be a church that says, come dwell among us. Sit enthroned on our praises. Sit enthroned on our, on our prayers. Hear our call. Hear our cry. We are desperate for you. We are hungry for you in a dry and weary land. We want to be an oasis of life. We want to be an oasis of fresh water where people can come and drink. Come Holy Spirit. Worship team, will you want to lead us in, uh, in the time of worship in response to this? Where he continued to express this, uh, this vision. I want to... Um, invite um, as a way of responding to, to anyone to um, like if you want to respond to this I, th I, I think the uh, <laughs> the first step is a step of submission um, so perhaps some of us 
may feel a call during the worship to, to, to kneel down as an expression like, yes, Lord, I'm, I'm available for you. I want to I wanna continue to hunger. I want to continue to invite you. I want to continue to, 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 to kind of express my yearning and my desperation for your presence. And I'm, I'm available. Fill me up. Send me out. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Maybe, maybe you can even just pick one of these prayers and, and, and make it your prayer today. But I want to invite you as, as a way of responding to the message. Um, like the prayer team will be ready for you after the service again to, to minister to you. But I, th I think now during this time of worship, maybe the, one of the main ways to respond is, is by kneeling down in worship.